And good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Ann Clark, and I'm the chair of the SIBSI HVAC group. And I'm here with Lucy Pemble, the co vice chair of the EPG group. And we're here to welcome you to our joint event Hydrogen Heating The Future in the UK The Good, the Bad, and Yes, the Ugly. So before we hand over to the main event, I'd like to give you a couple of minutes to grab a beverage of your choice, obviously. Make yourselves comfortable for what looks likely to be a controversial evening. For your information, you will all receive a CPD certificate. And for your information, this event is being recorded. So while people are still joining, we thought we'd give you a quick overview of our specialist groups. So the HVAC Specialist Group was launched in November 2017 and our mission is to support and encourage the efficient design, installation and operation of heating, ventilation and yes, air conditioning. We've grown in strength and numbers over the years um, by holding such events as these and we hope to promote and enhance knowledge, the knowledge and skills amongst our members and people interested in, in our industry. So our last event, which was the ongoing management of COVID, um, the operations of HVAC and UV systems, we actually saw record numbers of viewers and we almost got to 450 people, which is fantastic. Um, it was clearly a subject with a lot of interest and we hope to keep providing you with subjects that are relevant to you. So if you do have any ideas about future events, I'd love to hear from you please do contact us via the HVAC systems at sibsi.org email. And of course, if you'd like to become a member of our group, please log on to Sibsi under my profile, networks and groups, and pick the groups that you want to be associated with. Obviously, you're going to tick the HVAC group, um, and maybe Lucy, who I'm now going to pass you over to, will persuade you to join the energy performance group too. Over to you, Lucy. Thanks. Thanks very much, Marianne, and an equal warm welcome to all of you today to this joint event um, to discuss hydrogen heating and what it might look like for the UK. So just before we start, I'll tell you a little bit about the Energy Performance Group. Um, so we are set up to our mission is to encourage awareness and the possibilities about improving energy performance in buildings and mainly driving down carbon. Um, what do we do as a group? We mainly run events um, as well. We do power hours is one of our main things. So you may have attended. Um, these are a one hour sort of fact packed session um, with up to four speakers with lots of different opinions on key topics. So ones we've had recently have been on the performance of heat networks, for example, um, improving commercial offices to get them to net zero and responsible refurbishment um, of existing properties, for example, retrofitting them to net zero. Second example of things that we do are carbon bites. So these are one or two pages of summary information on key topics. And you can find all of those on the SIBSI website on the EPG page. So if you're just looking for a snapshot about, I don't know, um, PPAs, Power Purchase Agreement, you can head over there and read one that I wrote as a very short summary introduction to the topic. Something else that we do is joint events, and I'm very pleased that you've joined us for this one with the HVAC group. So I really hope you'll enjoy it and get a taste of what we do. If you are interested in joining our committee, we do have opportunities. We're all volunteers and we're a great, great network of people to get involved with. Um, you can get organizing events, grow your network, and we also respond to current consultations within the industry. So if you're interested in joining the committee in any capacity, you can email us at epg at .org and we'd definitely be glad to hear from you. Um, like Mary Marianne said, we also are looking for ideas for future events. So if you join us on LinkedIn and Twitter, you can vote for a future event. And then finally, before I hand you over to Helen, um, here's just a little graphic to say, um, go to my SIBSI and tick that you'd like to hear from the Energy Performance Group and tick that you would like to hear from the HVAC Systems Group to be notified of what's happening with us. Over to you, Helen. 
Thank you very much, Lucy and Marianne, for the introduction and oh. welcome everybody. We have 217 attendees for this webinar, which is fantastic that so many people want to join and learn about hydrogen. Um, I'm a sustainability professional working with Ricardo and I don't know that much about hydrogen other than what I've read in various uh, trade publications. So I'm really looking forward to learning all about the good, the bad and the ugly. And I hope you are too. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the event. Each speaker, we have five. You can see um, that our lovely speakers on the slide here. Uh, they each have 10 minutes to to uh, present on what they are talking about. And then depending if we have time, I might be able to sneak in a specific quick question after each person has spoken. But if not, we have 30 minutes of Q&A at the end. So we're aiming to start that Q&A at seven o'clock and uh, end at 7.30. So if you have a question, please pop it in to the uh, Q&A box. Um, if you've got a very specific question for someone on a, and reference a slide, please put the name of the presenter and the slide number, and that will really help us in terms of directing that comment. So um, let's get on with it. I'm very happy to introduce you to Serene Esuroso from the Carbon Trust. Um, Serene, I'm going to introduce her and maybe Serene, you can get your slides ready while I, uh, while I introduce you to the audience. So Serene has an MA in Energy Engineering from the University of Leeds and in her current role at the Carbon Trust is focused on supporting the development of strategic energy innovation programmes for the UK government. She was previously the secretary for the UK Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. And Serene will present an overview of the government's carbon reduction commitments and discuss the role of hydrogen in meeting these ambitious objectives. Over to you, Serene. Thank you very much, Helen, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm really happy to be here. Um, yes, as Helen mentioned, I'm Serene. I work at the Carbon Trust as an associate in the energy systems team, where I am supporting the delivery of our hydrogen activity. So the Carbon Trust is a sustainability consultancy. Uh, we work with businesses, governments and organisations around the world, supporting them in realising ambitious plans for a sustainable and low carbon future. We have over 200 colleagues operating across eight different countries. As you can see, we offer a range of services to support our mission of accelerating the move to a sustainable and low carbon economy. Also, I have quite a lot to get through. Hydrogen is such an exciting topic, so please let me know if I'm speaking too quickly. Okay, so across the globe, there's an increasing need to shift uh, and rapidly decarbonize our operations in order to stay within the two degree limit set by the Paris Agreement. Much progress has been made. However, there are three sectors where the barriers to decarbonization are greater. This is largely due to challenges with electrification. The various modes of heavy transport usually travel longer distances and carry larger loads. This would require larger batteries to electrify, which would be very, which are very expensive and come with an additional weight. There's also an issue with the recharge times, as many of these vehicles need to maximize their time on the road. This is an issue that's also felt by fleet vehicles, heavy or light. While some industrial processes can be electrified, many processes in heavy industry require the raising of steam and high temperatures. These can't always be achieved via electrification. And although heat pumps in many ways are an obvious route to decarbonising heat, there are a number of challenges that the UK building stock in particular faces with the implementation of this solution. So I refer to these three sectors as problem sectors throughout this presentation. The challenges for heat pumps have been, well, I've categorised them into three broad sectors, but there are more. So much of the UK's housing stock is very old and poorly insulated. Heat pumps require well insulated homes to work effectively and can be challenging to install via retrofit. Heat pumps also need indoor and outdoor space. Many homes in the UK, particularly those in urban areas, don't have this space to spare. For those that do, the retrofit can be incredibly invasive and disruptive to the consumer. And the upfront costs of installation and equipment for heat pumps can be prohibitively high, even with support and incentives from the government. Hydrogen is seen as an alternative to heat pumps due to its ability to overcome these barriers, 
with varying degrees of success and with minimal impact to the consumer. This is also the case for the other application for many applications in the other problem sectors that we have touched on. So to give you a bit of context, hydrogen is the oldest and most abundant element in the universe. It also has the highest energy per mass of any fuel. There are a multitude of production routes for hydrogen, each of which has been assigned a color. The three key colors are gray, blue and green. Grey hydrogen comes from unabated steam methane ref reformation. It's currently used in industrial applications around the world. The low carbon production routes that many countries, such as the UK, are examining in more detail are blue and green. Blue hydrogen comes from steam methane reformation coupled with carbon capture and storage, whereas green comes from electrolysis. This is where electricity is used to split a water molecule, generating hydrogen, oxygen and heat. Where some governments have committed to green over blue or vice versa, the UK is adopting a twin track approach and utilising both. As well as heat, hydrogen can be used to decarbonise industry and transport the other problem sectors. Additionally, it can be used for long term storage and for peaking power. It will play a big role in integrating renewables into the energy system and can support sector coupling. The big challenge facing hydrogen is the nascency of the sector. Where other energy system solutions, such as offshore wind or electric vehicles have been introduced, there has been a well-established market and mature infrastructure for them to engage with. With hydrogen, the entire value chain has to be built up while simultaneously matching supply with demand. Nascency also means that much of the hydrogen value chain is still high up on the cost curve. But there are a number of opportunities available. Gas networks are already upgrading existing infrastructure to be hydrogen ready. Industry is also prepared with hydrogen ready products such as boilers and fuel cell electric vehicles already on the market. The CCC predicts that by 2050, we'll be using 223 terawatt hours of hydrogen across the economy. Policies required to embed this hydrogen into the economy and realise this vision. Fortunately, we're moving in the right direction as we'll explore on the next slide. The UK's previous target of an 80% reduction on 1990 levels gave room for the problem sectors to hide in the remaining 20%. Following the publication of the CCC's report and the subsequent net zero legislation, this was no longer the case. As a result, hydrogen is experiencing a quote unquote hype as it's seen as key to decarbonizing these sectors. The publication of the 10 point plan highlights the government's priorities for accelerating the shift to net zero. Driving the growth of low carbon hydrogen is point two of this plan, containing a target of five gigawatt, five gigawatts of low carbon production by 2030. Other milestones under this point are 20% of hydrogen blended for all homes on the gas grid by 2023. Additionally, the government will support industry to begin a large village heating trial by 2025, with a possibility of evolving these plans into a pilot for a hydrogen town by 2030. The publication of the, the Climate Change Committee's sixth carbon budget starts to outline the role and scale of hydrogen across the energy system, predicting that by 2050, low carbon hydrogen production will be almost as large as electricity production today. But, and finally, Bayes' energy white paper builds on the Prime Minister's 10 point plan. Whilst it states that the feasibility of using hydrogen for heating is further testing and development, there's a lot of activity to address this, such as trials for converting existing appliances to hydrogen and some of the projects that we'll explore on the next slide. So there are a number of hydrogen for heat focused projects that have been running for a few years now. These have helped to inform the government's future ambition. H21 Leeds Citygate is a 2016 feasibility study on Leeds, proving that it was technically and economically viable to provide 100% hydrogen in the Leeds gas network. Hydroploy is a study that was being run on Kiel University, where 20% of hydrogen was blended into the gas supply between 2017 and 2020. 
And I won't talk too much about High for Heat as Heidi will be giving us a presentation on it later on this evening. As we discussed in the previous slide, um, the government has ambitions for hydrogen for a hydrogen village and a hydrogen town trial. But in addition to this, the government also has plans for what the 10 point plan terms as a super place. Or what are more commonly referred to as industrial clusters. Domestic, commercial and industrial heating will likely form some of the hydrogen demand in these industrial clusters or super places. What's becoming increasingly apparent is that this is, is that the heating solutions deployed will largely vary from region to region. Some regions will favour electrification via heat pumps, whilst others will be better suited to hydrogen. Heat networks could also play a role in both of these scenarios. So decarbonising heat will inevitably have an impact on the decarbonisation of the wider energy system, especially given the variety of solutions that will be deployed. Yesterday at Carbon Trust, we launched our Flexibility in, G in Great Britain report. This report investigates how flexibility can support our ability to reach net zero. Three heating pathways were modelled by Imperial College with different levels of flexibility, deployment and sensitivity analyses carried out. One of the key findings from this report was that the use of hydrogen across the energy system brings both carbon and cost benefits. To realise these benefits, however, a portfolio of production methods across blue and green hydrogen is required, as well as the availability of CCS infrastructure. We've had the first two days of our three day launch event, but you can still join us tomorrow to hear from the chair of the Hydrogen Committee at the Institution of Gas Engineers and Managers um, and the head of innovation for energy systems at Innovate UK, as well as a few others. But if there is one message that I could leave you with, it's just that there is no silver bullet to the decarbonisation of heating. To make the best use of the resources available and reach our net zero goals, we will need a mixture of solutions across the country. So thank you so much for listening. And if you'd like to find out more about our flexibility in Great Britain report or tomorrow's event, or if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serene. That was excellent. And I completely agree with the need for flexibility. So we do need to move on to our next speaker, uh, who is Chris Train. Uh, Chris Train of CT Energy. Chris is the former CEO of Caden, Britain's largest gas distribution network, and he is now spearheading ENA's Gas Goes Green program to create the world's first zero carbon gas grid here in the UK to hit our 2050 net zero carbon target. Now, Chris will present a view of hydrogen in terms of heating from the perspective of the gas industry and consider its aspects of sustainability. So please, uh, lovely audience, if you have a question, post it into the Q&A uh, box when you think of it uh, with the name of the speaker and the slide number if you've got a very specific question and we'll pick them up at the end. So Chris, over to you. Lovely, thank you very much, Helen. So yeah, Chris Train, I've uh, 38 years experience in the energy and utility sector and I stepped down as chief executive of Cadence about 18 months ago now and uh, I've been working on behalf of the five gas, gas networks on hydrogen strategy and policy development through the Energy Networks Association. So I'm really here talking on behalf of the, uh, the five gas networks, the four distribution networks and uh, national grid transmission. I also ought to uh, mention the interest that I was a HEVAC engineer probably about 30 years ago uh in my career so um you know i have a a great passion for the subject area and if we look at <clears throat> the challenge of decarbonizing heat then as a sector the energy sector has made significant progress and i used to run the electricity transmission network in national grid in the early days where renewables were starting to actually have an impact on the management of the system and uh, we have uh, we have done very well in the power sector but uh, we still have a long way to go in um, transport in heat uh, and particularly in industry as Serene 
was talking through her presentation there. So the decarbonisation of heat, I think, creates the biggest challenge. And one of the reasons that that is the biggest challenge is it represents approximately one third of our emissions. But more critically, 25 million homes will require a low carbon solution by 2050 in order to be able to uh, achieve the net zero. And all of the decarbonisation journey that we have had to date has uh, has been the customer has been um, immune to any developments and changes and we as an industry have helped to facilitate that but as we move into heat and transport and industry we start to impact downstream of the meter and therefore getting the consumer options right is going to be absolutely critical and I think we will have a mix of locally specific solutions. Um, and alongside that, throughout my career, um, we have talked about the goal of energy efficiency. And again, it's uh, critical, I think, in terms of the pathway that we move forward, that actually we improve the quality of our housing stock uh, and improve the level of energy efficiency and energy uh, awareness. <clears throat> but I think what we need to be able to do, and it goes to, again, another of Serene's uh, comments, there is no silver bullet, and therefore we need to create the, uh, the right environment for options. And consumer experience around affordability, safety and resilience are absolutely, uh, absolutely critical to this. So we believe as the networks that hydrogen has an important role to play in the transition to, uh, to net zero. And we can look at that through the lens of costs, the consumer, resilience of the energy system, uh, and of course, paramount safety and having a safe, uh, safe system in doing that. So, in looking at the developing the lowest cost solution for decarbonisation, um, as again, as Serene said, uh, some of the technologies are uh, in the early stages of development, particularly in terms of the supply chains and delivery, and costs will come down over time. And uh, it is important to optimise and develop um, low cost solutions and that we are not just catering to the early adopters within the climate change environment, but we are tackling fuel poverty as well as uh, those that have more money to, uh, to spend. And uh, a mix of low carbon technologies are needed for customers to provide them with choice. And hydrogen has the opportunity to decarbonise residential heat with no change in the experience for domestic customers. And Tom will cover a bit of that when he comes to his presentation later in this session. And I spent a lot of my career on energy resilience. I used to run the government's energy emergency executive and our energy networks have benefited very much from world leading uh, levels of resilience. And I think it's important that we consider that we need to be able to uh, deliver people's requirements no matter what the uh, weather conditions are outside and uh, if anybody's been following um, events in Texas you will have an understanding uh, around what I mean by that but last but not least particularly when we're talking about um, hydrogen the industry is working closely with the health and safety executive to de demonstrate the safety case and build on the existing evidence base. And we have the potential with hydrogen to be actually safer than the uh, current framework with natural gas, not least because when hydrogen burns, um, you don't have carbon monoxide, which uh, has long been a challenge for the uh, natural gas industry. So we need to focus on the customer experiences. We need to decarbonize heat. Um, 
and the availability of technologies will vary locally. So I think there's a, a strong call for more local planning around delivering efficient solutions. I'm here in the Midlands, not far away from Tisley, where Birmingham University have the, uh, uh, the uh, National Decarbonisation of Heat Centre. And if you look at the housing stock um, around Tisley and the industry around Tisley, then actually the best solution will be heat pumps in some instances. There's uh, waste heat available and therefore um, heat networks are part of the solution. And there's lots of very poor quality housing and hydrogen will be part of the problem. But unless you know Tisley, you couldn't uh, you couldn't really plan from a central perspective what the best solutions are for customers uh, in the uh, in the Tisley area. So I think that uh, solutions will be driven up locally. And <clears throat> the challenges um, around working in the home, if you look at the uh, industry's track record on the delivery of smart metering, you can see how challenging it is to work in the consumer home and therefore we need to put a lot of time and effort into uh, uh, engaging with customers uh, as we go through this journey together and as i've said i think an uninterrupted supply of heat is non-negotiable for customers now we produced uh, a report which is available on the energy network association website um, looking at the housing stock and of course what that indicates are some of the challenges around delivering heat pump technologies um, within the home but I think for me the underlying message for that is actually we need a range of technologies and actually we need some transitional technologies as well um, and uh, again um, Sari mentioned High deploy, which is the blending of hydrogen into the current national uh, natural gas mix, and you know that is very much a transitional opportunity to reduce the footprint now, but also build the capability and the efficiency in the supply chain for the de eventual deployment of 100% um, hydrogen networks. And. Um, Sari so mentioned some projects. This slide is really, uh, we do have to demonstrate the, the technology. And so one of the challenges is that we do need to work through the demonstration program so that hydrogen is very much an option. And I've uh, displayed four pictures here which illustrate uh, some of the work that we're doing. The first piece up from the top left there where people are scribing uh, on the wall is a piece of work that uh, Leeds Beckett University um, did on our behalf, looking at customers and customer behaviours. And I think there is a strong recognition by customers that um, the, the need to deliver low carbon solutions. But there's a lot of ignorance uh, as to how customers uh, engage uh, and move forward with that. The, the next picture on the right <coughs> is uh, High Street, which is uh, built on DMV's uh, Spade Adam test site, which is a, a, a row of houses um, that we have built with a gas distribution network to test the um, uh, hydrogen in the home and the hydrogen appliances in the home. And alongside that, in the bottom left there, there is uh, uh, a pair of semi-detached houses in Low Thornley in Gateshead, uh, where from next month uh, these will be 100% uh, hydrogens on the um, uh, on the local network, and we've been able to develop and adapt the next phase of the high deploy project, which is the blending uh, that was mentioned at Keele University, um, and because we have hydrogen production capability at the second phase on the public network at Wynn Leighton, um, we have taken the opportunity to build the, the houses and actually demonstrate what this means 
uh, in terms of the home. And then that uh, very bleak looking picture on the uh, right hand side there is um, the H100 project at Fife, which will be an end to end supply chain. So from uh, a wind farm producing green hydrogen uh, and delivering all the way to uh, to the customers and customer delivery. And that will be up and running by 2023. And this is just a small example, I think, of um, the work that we have been doing to be able to demonstrate the feasibility uh, of uh, hydrogen as a low carbon heating option. Uh, this is a slide which is far, far too difficult to read, but really it's there as illustrating. This is a, uh, a piece that we have been using through uh, social media, which is demonstrating the benefits of um, utilising hydrogen in the home. And I guess the message is from a customer perspective, it really does not change the nature of uh, how you both obtain and how you utilize heating uh, heating the home and um, it kind of does that Sorry, so that Chris must hurry you to the end i'm afraid yeah that's fine that's good timing because this is in fact my last slide and i think this is there to demonstrate that the complexity uh, and that complexity is, is driven that we need actually a whole system solution to deliver this we need a very systemic approach um, in order to uh, tackle the challenges uh, within the various supply chains and deliver customers options and choice at the lowest costs available to uh, decarbonize and meet the challenge of net zero by 2050. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Now we have lots of questions coming through in the Q&A box, so speakers are very much encourage you to have a look at these questions and answer them directly and help keep that kind of flow of knowledge going throughout our seminar, um, our webinar. Um, but uh, we must move on now. Thank you very much, Chris. We must move on to our next speaker, who's Dr. Richard Lowes from Exeter University. So Richard, if you can get your slides ready, I will just introduce you. So Richard is a researcher and lecturer at the University of Exeter's Energy Policy Group and has, has a particular interest in clean and sustainable heating. He's previously worked at a UK dras gas transporter and today he will be presenting a position which maybe challenges the idea of hydrogen use for mass scale heating. So Richard, are you ready? Over to you. Thanks very much, Helen. Uh, I think I'm ready. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm hoping that you can see my screen if I press that button. Yes, we can. Thank you. OK, great. So I can't see very much from this angle, but um, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and, and thanks very much for the invitation. Um, yes, as Helen said, I was invited to come and give the sort of um, sceptics view on hydrogen from an informed position. Uh, I didn't really want to come across as a total sceptic, so I thought I'd take the approach of, of using the event and using it to my, uh, the title of the event and using it to my advantage. So I'm literally going to be talking about what I think the good, the bad and the ugly bits of hydrogen for heating homes are. Um, I just wanted to start off with a couple of pictures, really, um, a couple of metaphors that some of you may have seen before. But uh, uh, many years ago, I think probably before I was born, actually, uh, a Heineken advertising campaign was based around this idea that Heineken refreshed the parts that other beers couldn't reach. Um, and I'm going to sort of explain why I think that's what the role for hydrogen um, in heating is. Um, and we'll come back to the champagne one at the end. Um, if you're lucky enough to be drinking champagne at the moment, I'm certainly quite jealous. OK, so um, whenever I do a presentation like this, I like to put it in the context of um, what we need to do, why we're doing this. And so um, the international, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, in their special report on one and a half degrees in 2019 said that to stay to um, a maximum warming of one and a half degrees by tw uh, 2100, um, and, and staying at that level is what's widely seen as a safe level that would protect, potentially protect coral reefs it would potentially um, protect mangroves um, and coastal zones, um, which are much more um, at risk from two degrees of warming. Um, so basically they said that the, the whole world got to meet zero emissions by 2060. Um, and so we need to get there well in advance of that as a um, industrialized um, and fairly well-off nation. Um, we've got the target of 2050, although arguably it should be um, even earlier than that. 
Um, but I really want to um, put into context why we're talking about this. We're not talking about hydrogen um, and, and homes um, because it just happens to be a good or a cheap thing to do. We're, we're talking about it because, because it is the right thing to do um, and it's the right thing to do very, very quickly. So I'll start with the good then. Um, so what is potentially good about hydrogen for heating? Um, so hydrogen can be produced um, from low energy, uh, low carbon sources. Um, so it can be a low carbon energy vector. Um, but to be low carbon, of course, it has to be produced from low carbon electricity um, or potentially it could be produced from fossil fuels, um, what was referred to as blue hydrogen earlier. So we've got our green hydrogen um, or our blue hydrogen. Um, for it to be um, clean and blue, it requires CCS, that's carbon capture and storage to work. Um, and the expectation is that that gas would be produced from uh, methane with the carbon stored. Worth noting, there's only one place in the world that's currently producing blue hydrogen, um, and that's in Canada from tar sands. Um, and it's actually not a specific hydrogen site. It's part of the wider um, cracking process. So we can potentially get to hydrogen, um, which is low carbon, but it's not particularly easy. Um, so in theory, we can use the existing pipes um, and I've seen a point raised in the chat about the um, current replacement works going on and um, this would require more um, investment in the gas grid. Uh, the figure is roughly 21 billion additional investment if you um, look at the Bayes numbers um, beyond the current Irons mains replacement program, which isn't being done for the reasons of hydrogen, it's being done for safety. It just so happens that those pipes uh, leak, uh, leak a bit less uh, and so naturally the network becomes more hydrogen ready um, but not hydrogen ready. Um, we also need more tests over safety. So um, it, it's never been done before. A gas network's never been converted to hydrogen or to low carbon hydrogen. Um, and it's quite different even from town's gas because it's pure hydrogen rather than a mix. Um, and the other um, biggie about using existing pipes is you can't slowly increase the blend up from say 10% to 100%. You need to have some sort of geographical switch over program. Um, which would need to be geographically based, possibly neighbourhoods, possibly part of towns, um, but um, it wouldn't, it's not something that naturally or organically can happen. It would need to be area by area. Um, it could potentially reduce the need for internal modifications to buildings. And so um, it was mentioned previously that heat pumps need um, internal works. They tend to work better with insulated buildings too, not necessarily a requirement, um, but certainly can work better. Um, so um, potentially you could reduce the need for internal modifications. However, having said that, um, we still expect uh, there to be a need for a lot of energy efficiency work anyway. Um, so um, making those modifications or, or removing the need for those modifications still um, it needs the other things to happen as well. So we still need to make sure the existing pipes work and we can get um, low carbon energy. So potentially it could be a low carbon energy vector which can use existing pipes and which could reduce the need for modifications to buildings. So the bad then, um, well, of all the most recent analysis, and this is uh, includes academic analysis and includes analysis from the CCC, uh, using hydrogen um, on its own in a building looks like a very expensive option compared to um, other approaches. Um, and so there's two bits of analysis that I'm highlighting here. Um, one is some uh, a report, Net Zero um, for Heating by UKIRK, which was released last year based on some analysis by some modelers. Um, and that basically showed that the most cost effective scenario um, had a lot of heat pumps, had a lot of district heating um, and a lot of energy efficiency, sort of the approach we've been talking about for many years. Um, I think really a couple of years ago, we, we thought hydrogen for heating could be the same price or similar price to electrification, um, but the net zero requirement moving from 80% to 100% really killed blue hydrogen, so hydrogen using CCS, meaning that all of the models had to shift towards green hydrogen, um, which is naturally more expensive than heat pumps, because if you're producing um, hydrogen from electricity, the conversion and the processes to produce the hydrogen naturally mean it will always be cheaper to use a heat pump. Um, and so even with repurposing the gas grid, even with using the existing infrastructure, um, heat pumps and district heating tend to look like they're more cost effective options. So they, they do look cheaper. Um, the other thing that's worth noting about hydrogen is that it locks in a high OPEX cost. Um, so you will always be required to have this uh, potentially six or nine pence per kilowatt hour of hydrogen. Um, it, it may come down, but that's a sort of optimistic level for 2050, maybe six or nine pence. Um, but with the heat pump and the energy efficiency route, 
uh, you do have a, a, a sort of a, a structural cost reduction because your overall the energy system is smaller and using less energy. Um, and so the CCC's analysis really said that um, if you do the heat pumps and you do the energy efficiency and you do it properly before 2050, once it's done, you actually get cheaper ongoing costs um, than we currently um, have. Um, and I think the other thing worth saying is the CCC analysis, um, which said similar things to the UKIRC analysis, did say um, that uh, most buildings should have heat pumps um, fundamentally, but some of them could be hybrid systems with connections to the gas grid. And in those situations, which would ideally, uh, which would primarily, sorry, be in industrial areas, um, they would potentially have converted gas grids just in regional zones. Um, just to talk about the bad continued, um, if we ignore blue hydrogen, so hydrogen from CCS, which I think we can because it's not really a low carbon or sustainable thing to do, um, relying on green hydrogen is extremely um, resource intensive. You just need a lot more uh, wind turbines or solar panels or whatever to produce that hydrogen um, at scale. Uh, and so roughly uh, it's perhaps six times the amount of offshore wind that you'd use um, relatively. I think it might be a bit less than six times um, because you would still need some for storage um, in that example and for balancing. And I agree with the other comments on flexibility. Fundamentally, a green hydrogen system is a much bigger energy system um, than a heat pump system. Um, and as a result, it has knock on impacts for costs, which I've talked about already. Um, but it also has knock on impacts in terms of things like embodied carbon um, in the wind turbines, in the wires um, and so obvious cost knock-ons associated with that. OK, and just to touch on the ugly bits, um, increasingly it's being recognised that there's a real heavy push for hydrogen from um, what some people might refer to as the incumbents or vested interests and so on. And this has been picked up very recently in the Times, uh, Times uh, Sunday, I think it was two weeks ago. Um, and um, that was analysis that they'd done themselves, so nothing to do with the work that I've done, which showed a similar thing. But really we know, and you can see it's on the public record in terms of who's funding things like parliamentary groups and who's funding trade associations, we know there's an extremely strong push. Um, and that extremely strong push, which I've also an an analyzed in detail, um, others such as um, the Corporate Observatory for Europe have too, um, have seen this increase in hydrogen interest happen at the same time um, as it's really grown in terms of political interest. Um, and this is all um, despite the fact that an actual gas grid has never been converted to low carbon hydrogen ever. I guess the final thing to say on this slide, um, just to labour the point, is that um, I, I think it's ugly, not because I necessarily disagree with lobbying, but I think anything that um, detracts from technologies that we know can decarbonise heat and we know that can work at scale because they do in other countries, um, I think there's a real issue there um, that we might potentially be seeing people trying to stall change um, when we know that the challenge for decarbonisation um, is so huge and needs to happen so quickly. OK, so just in terms of the value of hydrogen then from a sort of technical or system perspective, Others agree with this, um, it's not just me saying this, um, it provides instantaneous high temperatures when burnt. Uh, and so that's a really useful attribute, particularly in bigger buildings um, or in buildings that are less well insulated. Um, and it's really important from a storage of energy perspective. We actually think hydrogen could be the big interseasonal storage form. Um, and that's certainly how it appears in the energy system models. Um, but in that context, it's being used to store energy at times of excess production, perhaps in the summer, autumn or spring. Um, and that energy is then being used in salt caverns or, or storage sites and used in power stations to back up the power sector um, in this much more um, electrified um, system. But it's inefficient and pricey. So when you produce your hydrogen, um, you are uh, losing possibly half, maybe a bit less in the electrolysis process. That might get a bit better, but because of the nature of the process, you will always be losing some. Um, you have to have an electrolyzer to do that. Um, and storage and transportation. So as a result, it's always going to be um, more expensive um, than electricity if you're producing it at scale. Um, and that's why um, overall, uh, I think, and the modeling and the analysis that I've seen suggest that if you're using hydrogen for heating, um, it should either be used for peaking, um, so in hybrid heat pumps, um, or to balance the wider energy system um, in heat networks, um, or balancing the electricity system, like I've mentioned previously. And I'm, I'm really pleased to see that um, some organisations, some NGOs are getting get together at last to try and sort of counteract some of this lobbying and just point, uh, make these quite sensible points. Um, and no one's saying that hydrogen doesn't have value. We're just saying that it doesn't have value um, everywhere.
and potentially doesn't have value at scale for heating. Um, so just finally, um, I'll try and be quick here because I know that time's um, ticking on um, and it's primarily a, an image based conclusion section. Uh, so um, there's this quote that I think is great, um, and this is from uh, Des Spiegel, and it was a couple of weeks ago this came out, um, and their writer, their head of science, said hydrogen is the very expensive champagne of the energy transition, but you, dro you don't drink it at every opportunity, um, only on special occasions, because it would be too expensive as a thirst quencher. Um, this uh, merit order diagram I think is great. It puts into context where the real value of hydrogen is, um, and I think this sort of approach where we think about where it has the most value is really uh, interesting. And just finally, if you didn't see it yesterday from the International Energy Agency, um, they have really said that uh, for the whole world, by 2050, heat pumps become the dominant source of energy. Um, so this isn't a British thing, this is a, a really a worldwide thing. OK, and there's some references. Brilliant, thank you very much. Richard and uh, just to let everyone know the slides will be made available and the video after the event so you can always uh, dip into Richard's references there. Thank you Richard. We don't have any time to ask you any direct questions right now I'm afraid we move on swiftly to our next speaker uh, but have a look in the Q&A box um, to see if you can answer in dry any directly. So we are now going to move on to Tom Collins. Um, so Tom please get ready. Uh, Tom is from Bosch Thermo Technology and he leads the hydrogen ready boiler development team at Bosch and he's going to be discussing the practicalities and timelines involved in replacing existing gas fired boilers. Over to you Tom. Thank you very much Helen. Um, so yes my name is Tom Collins, I've worked at Worcester Bosch for 15 years and I've been in R&D that whole time. Uh, that means I've had the chance to join our kind of battle to find ways of finding low carbon technologies, um, in particular ones that work in the UK. Uh, I've worked on heat pumps, I've developed hybrid systems, I've developed district heating units. Uh, so uh, I've, I've been through the mill with technologies uh, and as a business we've ploughed a lot of money into trying to develop new technologies to decarbonise heat, particularly uh, domestic heat. And unfortunately, despite all these efforts, um, including massive pushes on training and promotion of heat pumps and solar, we still sell mostly boilers. Um, in the UK, I think 1.7 million boilers are installed each year. Um, now we're all kind of grieving that situation because we need to move away from fossil fuels as quickly as possible. Um, but there are some good reasons why we're in that predicament. Um, obviously, if we look at a new build property, which most of us are probably most busy with each day, um, uh, we can easily build good insulation into the fabric of the building and of course that's the first thing we should always be doing when we talk about decarbonising heat. Um, we can also install properly sized heat emitters suitable for a low temperature system. Uh, we can build space into the design of the property for heat storage and equipment um, and we can put in a controls regime while the user changes behaviour when they move uh, property. We can make sure that that controls regime suits, suits a heat pump or another low carbon technology. Looking at retrofit, the UK has an incredibly diverse population of older buildings that are often very uh, densely packed together. Um, if you want to install a heat pump, which has been deck and now bases kind of default position for a long time, um, we have to uh, make some take take some piece of technology out of the living space. That's where boilers live in the UK. Replace it with something else that um, fits in that space and something external if it's air source. We probably have to make room for some storage again because in the UK, 17 million houses have now had their heat storage removed when a combi boiler was installed. Um, we may well, we're almost certainly going to have to change some heat emitters to move to a lower temperature system. Um, and of course, we're going to have to change controls. Now, um, that's not so bad if you're going to insulate the property well, um, but there are limits to what you can do with preheating or keeping the house warm. Um, UK residents don't like waking up hot, we've learned the hard way. And in perhaps around 10% of properties, um, the pipe work for that heating system won't be appropriate and might need uh, renewing. And that's kind of one element of all, all these combined ones that mean uh, often disruption or at least a longer installation time is associated with a heat pump. Um, and that's on top of this upfront cost that Serene mentioned. Um, as well as unfortunately due to sometimes a lack of skills and uh, knowledge amongst installers, a sense of uncertainty about the performance of the appliance in the end. Now some of the things can be overcome and we will overcome them 
but you can sort of understand why there's been a barrier and UK consumers and installers have so far kept installing boilers. That's the predicament I spent the first two thirds of my career trying to find a way around. Um, there's also an energy system challenge that others have touched upon. Uh, uh, heat demands has very large peaks in the morning and early evening. That's a challenge for an energy system as well as the seasonal one that Rich mentioned. It, and even it's not the size of the peaks that create a massive demand, but the rate of change is very strenuous for an electricity network, for example. Um, and at the moment, gas meets that uh, by having that a very distributed, deployable, large store of energy through the line pack, the gas squeezed into the pipes. And by varying that pressure, it's called line pack variation, we can deploy energy very quickly morning and evening. And the gas system does that, not only supporting heat, which is a huge demand, three times in the, in the winter what our current electricity system delivers, um, but also to support the electricity system through all the combined cycle gas stations, pulling that same line pack from the transmission system. Um, Perhaps it's an interesting point to note, while, while renewable electricity and heat pumps have excellent end-to-end -end efficiency, as Rich mentioned, at energy system level, that's not really, that's not going to be the point. Grid efficiency was everything back in the days of fossil fuel. As we move into the future, it's becoming all about managing the difference in the time profiles of renewable generation and human end use. So in short, it's all about energy storage. Um, and, you know, we've already touched upon the benefits of hydrogen for that. So we're a bit stuck. We need, we need, to, we need to fuel... Um, uh, we need to do something about heat and, and there's nothing we can get people to adopt. Uh, and that's where the uh, H21 Lead Citygate report came in, um, which showed that there it does, it's a very, very extensive desk study actually. Uh, a lot of modelling of the system, a lot of experimental work is now even carrying on being conducted, showed that yes, it's feasible for us to upgrade our gas system. And again, as Rich pointed out, the, uh, the gas distribution networks being renewed with polythene pipe, which makes a lot of that work a lot of that pain already done for the gas system. And of course, in the UK, many of us will be sitting here going, yes, I know we've done this before. We did the town's gas conversion in the 1970s. Actually, interestingly today, it's a similar number of appliances to be changed. It's just now there are more boilers and fewer cookers and fires. Um, there are a few ways we can look at how you might migrate that technology. Rich talked about the challenge of migration. Um, you could look at converting an existing boiler like we did in the 1970s, but actually for some good technical reasons, that's not feasible. Um, H21 actually modelled exchanging the whole boiler. Um, and at a macro level, the costs were pretty competitive with other ways of decarbonising. Um, but uh, at a local economic level, it's really not attractive because a lot of plumbers will be scratching their heads working out what to do for a few years if you suddenly renew all the boilers at once. Maybe you could have a boiler that just automatically switches fuels. That would be really nice. But again, it's perhaps a stretch too far for a technical solution. But there was a fourth option that occurred, which is why don't we design a hydrogen boiler? We can back convert that in the factory to natural gas and sell it as a natural gas boiler where people are still on natural gas that can be converted really quickly, really easily uh, to hydrogen. Uh, and that's really what's been adopted and that Bayes are now investigating and exploring and supporting through high heat. So um, the story in the house then becomes a bit simpler. Um, at end of life, when a boiler naturally re uh, is replaced, we replace it with a hydrogen ready variant. And on the day that the network gets switched over, we change a few parts and the boiler is burning green gas. Um, it, uh, those components would be, for those of you who are techie, <laughs> perhaps a burner, a gas restrictor and a code plug. It's very similar for those in the field to an LPG conversion. It's an LPV, LPG conversion plus a burner. Uh, and the boilers really are identical from the end user point of view. From the outside, it's identical. Even if you're an installer, on the inside, it's identical. Um, actually, all the changes happen inside one little module that burns the gas. And even in there, many of the components would be absolutely familiar, they're, they're identical to the ones that uh, engineers are working with today. So um, the technology is a real like-for-like -like replacement in terms of a lot of the technology and the experience. So where are we? We have a team of engineers um, bringing these uh, boilers to readiness, in particular for the uh, H100 project that Chris mentioned, happening up in Fife. So late next year, we look forward to end users uh, using hydrogen boilers. Um, we've already had this boiler up in uh, Spade Adam that Chris mentioned. This is on the inside. That boiler has been heating that house over the winter. 
But really where I want to land is, you know, I've been talking about hydrogen boilers for a while. Um, there's going to be a mixture of technologies in the future. Hydrogen is not, you know, the the, uh, the slogan for this, this session was saying, what's going to be the dominant technology? And I think that's the wrong question. We're not looking for a dominant technology. Um, we're looking at a future where there's a diverse range of technologies and um, we need all of them. Uh, there's a un there's kind of universal agreement that hydrogen should be used for use cases that are hard to do uh, or hard to electrify. And what's being realised uh, is that heat and in particular domestic heat is one of those hard to do things. Uh, and really, it's not a technology competition. There'll be no one size fits all solution. It's going to be mo a mosaic of technologies to suit different applications. Heat pumps, hydrogen and district heating will all play major roles. Uh, and I'm I'm looking forward to getting them deployed successfully in the UK as quickly as possible. Uh, I'll try and leave time if there is any, uh, Helen, for questions, but I suspect there's not. Um, and so I'll leave it there from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Yes, you've predicted correctly. There's no more. There's no time less for a direct question to you right now. We must crack on with our uh, last but no means least speaker but we do have lots of questions that are piling up for the Q&A session. So uh, please, although I repeat speakers, please do look at the Q&A and answer any um, questions that you find particularly interesting. OK, so we must move on to Heidi. Heidi Dunomi is based in the Energy Advisory Programme team in Arab. And she is experienced in delivering multidisciplinary infrastructure projects. And in recent years, her work has focused on the whole system energy transition, and particularly the role that innovation in hydrogen can play to support the achievement of a decarbonised future. Um, and so she is currently leading the Arab Plus team on the High for Heat programme. Heidi, over to you. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity for presenting. Um, one of the challenges of going last is I will um, hopefully try and say some similar things but in a slightly different way um, to keep you entertained. I will be covering obviously insights into some of the heating challenge we have in the UK but touching more on the progression and the development that's been made over the last few years particularly focusing on hydrogen for heating. But before I do, we move on to the next slide, there we go, um, just to touch on this map, this global map of which is effectively a heat map of where the most renewable energy sources are across the globe. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is to, to share the thought that there is not a shortage of energy anywhere in the world. The challenge is our ability to access that energy and transport it from one area to another where the energy is needed. The existing energy system we have is clearly quite complex. And here we're just sharing a schematic view of how an energy system may start transitioning um, as we move to a decarbonised future. But the key thing to point and note is that any transition to any future is going to require changes both in the input technologies and output and end technologies. Um, the system's integrated, it's complex, there's capacity constraints at various different areas, both locally, regionally and nationally. Um, and any kind of transition is going to require a level of intervention to allow us to move away from carb from a low carbon situation to a zero carb sorry a, a carbon situation to a low carbon or zero carbon situation this diagram here you can see is an end-to-end -end, um, system of the gas network um, and that's really important from, from the gas network the whole system needs to work um, together at the same time and that's one of its challenges with the, the transition um, to a decarbonized future but one of the great advantages of hydrogen and its flexibility is both how it can be produced and then how it can also be used. So you can see here hydrogen can be produced in either blue or green manner, um, green from renewables, blue from um, um, methane reform reformation and existing fossil fuel in combination with carbon capture and storage. Um, and from an end use perspective, hydrogen can equally be used for a number of different areas, whether it be heat, transport or um, power. I wanted to share this graph with you because this is a really important one and one worth um, remembering. Um, just to run through in uh, quickly um, some of the detail, the red line you can see here is the electricity um, consumption um, line 
running fairly consistently across the years at a much lower level than the gas consumption, which is the blue line that you can see going up and down. And obviously it's going up and down for our cold winter months where we all tend to use um, heating um, hydrogen, sorry, not hydrogen, gas for heating our homes. And the grey line you can see here is the transport um, demand, which is predominantly oil based. But just to note a few points, which I think Chris may have already mentioned, but heating and cooling UK homes accounts for about half of all energy consumption, um, which equates to about a third of all carbon emissions. And more than 80% of existing homes use gas for heating. Bearing in mind, much of this existing housing stock will still be in use by 2050. Um, it's these type of properties um, that could potentially prove quite hard to come off the gas grid. And if we think about converting one energy system to another one, it's fairly inconceivable to think that we could expand our electricity network to something like four times um, the size that it is now. But to, to particularly meet the, that top point you can see there when we had the beast from the east and it was very cold and many people just blasted up their boilers. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine us expanding the electricity network and imagine more pylons and cables at various different places across the UK um, to meet those same sort of demand levels, which varies across the years. So just to touch then on um, the right solutions for decarbonising our homes, and there is a variety of different solutions um, and I've, I've listed them out here and it's really about choosing the right solution for the right situation. Firstly, a kind of no brainer in a way, we should do as much as we possibly can to reduce our energy consumption. Um, so insulation is really important. Heat networks are fantastic, particularly for high built um, and high density built environment areas. Heat pumps, ground source, air, air source, that technology is ready now. Um, and should be, be deployed as much as possible. Boilers, our existing boilers can use up to um, a blend of about 20% hydrogen and natural gas and hydrogen uh, or fully hydrogen ready boilers um, are feasible and looking like they may be available soon-ish potentially. Obviously mentioned equally as well, other, there's other hybrid um, solutions heat pumps and boilers combined. And then there's also quite interesting micro fuel cell um, combined heat and power technology that's coming along, um, which I think could be a really interesting um, position in the medium to longer term. But the key point I wanted to make is that actually we've only got 30 years left to decarbonise our entire system and all our home heating. Um, so regardless of what choice we make, that's if we were to start tomorrow, we would be looking at converting nearly a million homes per year consistently from, from now on, which is one huge um, logistical and project management challenge. So moving on to Hyper Heat then. Um, Hyper Heat is a Bayes funded um, innovation program. program. Um, it started in around 2017 and essentially the mission was to determine whether it's technically possible and safe to use 100% hydrogen in the home downstream of the ECV and meter in the consumer's home. At the outset, um, the thinking was very much focused on the end goal of 2050 um, and understanding that gas will potentially have a role to play based on the graph that I shared with you earlier. And the, the programme really set out to answer the question, is hydrogen a decarbonisation pathway that should remain open as a future potential option. Much progress has been made since 2018 and we've seen technology readiness levels go from a very low level to a much higher level now, um, which is it was great to see in such a short space of time. The programme is made up of a number of different work packages that you can see outlined here, but to cover the main broad areas, um, the programme is looking at developing and it has been developing um, standards and certification, developing the appliances that, that could be potentially used both in domestic properties and commercial facilities, looking at providing all the evidence for the safety case for a safety assessment, and then moving into which we're beginning to see now some demonstrations and showrooms or show homes. Just to touch very briefly here, and apologies if there's any organisations that are missing off this diagram, 
the Hyper Heat programme um, and governance structure um, has been made up of a huge number of different organisations and stakeholders, and there's been much effort gone into the engagement um, and coordination of all these different organisations to make the Hyper Heat the success that has been to date in a short period of time. The safety assessment work is still in progress, but much work has been undertaken. Um, you can see here from the diagram that Hyper Heat is obviously focused very much downstream of the ECV, the emergency control valve, um, whereas the gas distribution network operators under the H21 programme and H100 programme are gathering all the safety evidence upstream of the ECV. There are um, high levels of confidence that the system can be made to be as safe as natural gas. And we are currently waiting for a verdict or probably more appropriately to say comment from the HSC who are undertaking an independent review of the safety assessment work that's been undertaken to date. So moving on to the exciting part with regards to all the appliances, um, the Hyper Heat programme has developed a number of different appliances. The challenge that was set to the industry was to make the appliances like for like of to today's appliances, so same sort of space, size um, that they can fit in, operability, um, and also the challenge we were set around is it possible to make these appliances hydrogen ready from a conceptual point of view, um, with the view that in the future this would be potentially help smoother um, transition and conversion, particularly from a consumer perspective. I'm delighted to say that industry has done a wonderful job and I don't think any of us back in 2017, 2018 um, realised quite how much progress would have been made in such a short period of time, which is really encouraging. There is still more progress to be made. <clears throat> There's a number of appliances that have achieved um, um, safety certification and there's still further development to be done to make them um, commercially available and sellable products, but progression has been um, made and by the end of the high for heat programme, many of these appliances will be at that near commercial point. Just some myths to dispel. Um, clearly you can see the hydrogen flame. Um, this is down to clever burner design. Um, they all have similar physical size and dimensions. They operate in a similar way um, and it's anticipated that the price points will be similar. There's also some good news um, with regards to NOx levels, which appear to be significantly reduced. Um, and this was an unexpected finding at the start of this work um, and more scientific and academic work is underway to understand that characteristic in more detail. So lastly, then, um, just to end, there's a huge amount of information available on the High for Heat website. So please do take a look there if you're interested in any of the reports that have come out of High for Heat. Um, demonstrations have started are in, and are underway. Hopefully you'll be able to see some of these appliances at COP26 or the new showroom or show home or hydrogen home um, that has been mentioned previously in Gateshead, where people will be able to come along and touch the technologies and play with them, um, which will be great. But don't get too excited because the beauty of them is they're very much the same as our existing appliances. Um, <clears throat> The programme has also enabled confidence for the first community pilot um, trials, 300 homes or so um, that are planned up in Scotland, Fife, and this will be using green hydrogen from a local wind turbine source. This is work, work as I understand, is very much um, started, but it's in the planning phase at the moment, so probably we'll see activity in homes being converted probably 2023 um, and after, thereafter. The government 10 point plan. Um, has also seen or has also said that um, UK would like to see both a hydrogen neighbourhood developed, moving on to a hydrogen village and then a hydrogen town by 2030. And so it's really great credit to all of those that have been involved in the Hyper Heat programme that this option is still on the table.